Great, okay, so we're going to make a start now. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for this panel discussion on sex work, prison abolition and public health. This is the third event in a series that we've been running at Autograph, uh, exploring human rights in light of COVID-19. You can find a recorded version of the previous two events from the series on our website, which were on race and migration and disability justice. My name is Livy and I manage the learning and participation programme at Autograph, which is a public gallery in Shoreditch, London, where we explore issues of identity, representation, human rights and social justice through photography and lens-based media. Um, tonight, we have BSL interpretation being provided by Ali Gordon and Sharon Thind. They should be visible on your screen throughout the night, but do drop us a message via the chat box if they disappear at any point and we'll try to fix that for you. Uh, we will also have a Q&A section at the end of the event, so if you'd like to submit a question to the panel, you can do that either through the Q&A tab in the Zoom uh, webinar or through the comments section if you're watching on YouTube. Before I hand over to Lola Olafemi, who will be hosting tonight's event, I just want to give thanks to Arts Council England and Esme Fairbairn Foundation for their support of Autograph's programme. So, by way of introduction to Lola, uh, Lola Olafemi is a Black feminist writer, organiser and Stuart Hall Foundation scholar from London. Her work focuses on the uses of uh, the feminist imagination, its relationship to political demands and futurity. She is author of Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, which was published earlier this year by Pluto Press, and it's a brilliant read. I highly recommend buying copy. Uh, Lola is also a member of Bare Minimum, which is an interdisciplinary anti-work arts collective. Uh, so Lola, over to you. Thanks so much, Libby. Um, I think uh, I want to kind of get right into it and start by attempting to define the moment we're in uh, for the sake of this conversation um, or at least kind of point to its urgency and to say that when we'll be asking these um, questions when our panelists will be answering them um, these questions about public health and about coronavirus they're not talking in kind of abstract terms um, the effects of coronavirus in the UK have been devastating and made all the more devastating by the neoliberal decimation of infrastructures of social care almost 50,000 people have died um, uh, from this virus because of they were callously abandoned by the government's public health strategy and the state has made it very clear that it doesn't really care who lives or dies and the racialized disparities um, in coronavirus deaths tell us this. Um, they also tell us something about precarious work and capitalist exploitation and how those determine how people keep themselves safe and this idea that safety is somewhat of a lottery in these conditions. But I guess even more devastating um, is the consequences of this virus for those outside of our understanding of who is worthy of public health attention, prisoners, survivors of domestic violence, sex workers. And this is kind of inextricable from the intricate web of policing prisons and the law that expel certain bodies and, and banish them to the realm of the unthinkable so others can be kept safe. So in other words, if we feel safe, it's only because others are kept unsafe. Um, thinking about this and thinking about the ways that these communities have uh, come together in light of coronavirus to keep each other alive or without the help of the carceral state I think provides the first kind of step for thinking through radical public health approaches and to do that we're going to have uh, presentations by three um, incredible speakers. So first we'll have Elio Beale who's a grassroots organizer with Swarm and Bent Bars um, and a project coordinator for Decriminalized Futures which is a collaborative project using creative tools and popular education to explore sex workers lives experiences and movement struggles. Elsewhere they also organize work and research about abolition, health, popular education, creative interventions for movement building and queer and trans liberation. Then uh, we'll have Kelsey, who's an organizer and educator with CAPE and Cradle Community, uh, which are grassroots abolitionist groups. CAPE is part of a network of local campaigns resisting prison expansion in the UK and Cradle is a collective focused on transformative justice and community accountability, supporting our communities to build the skills we need to support each other. And then we'll have Dr. Avia Sarah Day, who's a lecturer in criminology at Birkbeck University of London, as well as an activist in the East End chapter of Sisters Uncut. Sisters Uncut is a national direct action collective fighting cuts to domestic violence services as well as state violence. So we'll have presentations from them, then we'll have a bit of a Q&A and then we'll have questions from the audience um, uh, at the end. So we'll start with Elio. Hi, thank you for that really lovely introduction. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about some of the work I do. Um, hopefully I will stick to the 10 minutes. Um, so my name is Elio. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I organize with SWARM and Bent Bars, and I'm also a member of the London Renters Union and of UVW, which is the United Voices of the World, a workers' union. 
um, and I also run a project for Hi, I'm I'm so sorry to have to interrupt your presentation, Elio, but your sound mm -hmm. is really, really low for me. I don't know if other people are experiencing that the same. This happens sometimes on Zoom. Let me just turn it up. Is that better? Oh, that's yes. better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's much better. Great. Thank you. No worries. Um, so yeah, I organize a swarm and Bent Buzz. I'm a member of London Renters Union. I'm a member of VVW and I run Dignified um, Futures, which well, I gave a really nice intro for and is an art and popular education project um, that focuses on sex work and sex workers, but is really deeply about movement building a lot across a lot of kind of different social justice and labor movements struggles. Um, so mostly I'm gonna be talking about Swarm and the work that we've done in responding to the pandemic and our mutual aid work. But I just wanna talk really briefly about Bent Bars. Um, I'm totally sure that Kelsey's gonna talk a lot more about prisons later, but um, Bent Bars is an LGBTQ prisoner pen pal project. And we connect queer and trans people inside a prison with queer and trans people outside of prison uh, as pen pals. And we don't do this as a support service, but really coming from a perspective of solidarity and of seeing the relationships that are built across the prison walls as being reciprocal, mutually supportive relationships. Um, we're a letter writing project, so kind of adapting to the lockdown was difficult. But when you have a situation where 80,000 people are in de facto solitary confinement and prison visits suspended and contact with families really limited, you know, the mail that we were sending was really delayed in reaching people. Um, you know, this is kind of exacerbating the problem with prisons in the first place that we isolate people from communities and from wider society. Um, and I think that bars has been really important for a long time, but especially over the last few months at really challenging that isolation. Um, we've had a lot of people outside of prison signing up to the project saying it was because the isolation of lockdown had, had made them realize or think more about how important it would be for people inside prison to have someone to write to or be in contact with. Um, and when we talk about the abolition of prisons, that's really got to be built off these networks and relationships that we can build across prison walls and, and being able to understand each other and listen to each other and care for each other without judgment and without letting the state decide, um, you know, who's deserving of that care or whether those connections can happen. And I think that's something that queer and trans people often really deeply or instinctively understand, even if they're not necessarily a prison abolitionist, this kind of desire to exist unencumbered by shame or without fear of punishment and violence. Um, but going back to SWARM, um, SWARM is a grassroots sex worker led collective. So we've been around for 11 years, uh, building sex worker community, advocating for sex worker rights, in particular, the full decriminalization of sex work and generally trying to improve working conditions for sex workers and sex worker safety from violence. Um, we really explicitly identify state and police violence as a key cause of harm for sex workers. You know, we see state violence as including border violence, austerity, state imposed poverty, and we situate ourselves as part of a global fight for sex workers' rights, you know, grounded in principles of solidarity and mutual aid. Um, you know, some of what we do are mutual aid projects, which includes an emergency hardship fund, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But we also do advice and support sessions, helping sex workers navigate the benefit system or registering self-employed or dealing with housing issues. Um, I mentioned that I also organize with the London Renters Union, which um, if you're listening to this and you're a renter in London, you should really join, grab a little scrap of paper now and write down a reminder and do it after the call. Um, but Ella, you also do a lot in terms of supporting renters and doing eviction assistance training and calling on the government to extend the eviction ban and scrap no fault evictions and generally fighting back against the ways that renters are uh, fucked by the state and by landlords. Um, we have a day of action coming up on August the 24th, so you should join for that as well as joining the union. Um, but in terms of sex worker mutual aid in the UK, as well as SWARM, there's the sex worker branch of United Voices of the World, who've had some amazing wins for workers in the last couple of months and the English Collective of Prostitutes, who as well as running great campaigns, do incredible work one-on-one -on -one with sex workers, supporting them in dealing with the police and the legal system. Um, Swarm run a lot of like sex work only spaces and gatherings, events. Um, we've had workshops that support sex workers in building the skills that um, they tend to not teach you in university. Um, and a few weeks ago, we had a sex worker of color online event and we're building a sex trans sex worker network. Um, across the UK, there's also Crosstalk who do sex like weekly breakfast for sex workers um, and distribute supplies and Umbrella Lane in Scotland who also host events and brunches for sex workers and have a support fund. Um, Swarm also create resources for sex workers. We have a lot of zines about for sex workers on our website. And in the last couple of months, we've created support resources with information about Corona and harm reduction, mental health, 
resources for pa sex working parents. Um, and we made a guide for applying for universal credit and a public resource about how to support victims of domestic abuse without um, involving the police. Uh, I guess in terms of more public events, we've been kind of busy, so we haven't done that so much, um, but Decriminalized Futures has a lot more events. Um, the project involves 13 different artists working on 10 projects, um, making creative work that responds to the themes and conversations of the Swarm 10 year anniversary that we held in May 2019. So there's an exhibition of this work that was scheduled for September, but that's been postponed till next year. Um, but the work that's being made is really incredible and I'm really excited for people to be able to see it. Um, and all the recordings that the artists are responding to from the Swarm Conference are up on our website, decriminalizedfutures.org, so you can go and listen to them. Um, and we have a monthly reading group for each recorded discussion. So this month we'll be focusing on the Nordic model or the end demand model relating to prostitution. Um, again, you can sign up for the reading group on our website. And we're working with Abolitionist Futures and with Verso Books um, to do a series of events around abolition and mutual aid through September. Um, that'll be on Wednesdays and I think they're gonna be really excellent. Um, I think just because I referred to it briefly and I don't want to go into too much detail, but I will talk a little bit about legal models if that's all right to do. Yeah. Um, really, I would strongly recommend you go and find the Juno Mac TED talk called The Laws That Sex Workers Really Want because she gives an incredible overview and is an excellent speaker. Um, but I'm just going to give a little intro that says that when I say we fight for decriminalization, I mean the full decriminalization of sex work. Um, there are some people, including prominent women MPs and groups that say they're fighting exploitation who really strongly advocate for the Swedish model, also known as the Nordic model, or in the United States, they call it the equality model. Um, but fundamentally, it's a legal model that says that we need to quote unquote end demand for prostitution by criminalizing the purchase of sexual services, uh, criminalizing clients and generally utilizing a whole scope of carceral tools to sort of rescue sex workers from exploitation. Uh, Swarm do not support this model. Most sex workers globally do not support this model because it harms sex workers. Um, and in countries where it's been introduced, such as Sweden, Ireland, France, we've seen a rise in violence towards sex workers, really terrible working conditions for sex workers, um, and increased police attention and state violence, including deportation and denial of medical care. Um, fundamentally, criminalizing clients also criminalizes sex workers, and the Swedish model harms sex workers. It harms people working in the sex industry. And while we have a legal system or a criminal justice system or a parliament, though maybe they're going to disappear along with Public Health England. Um, but in the meantime, the only viable legal model that supports sex worker safety and autonomy is... Elio, Elio, could I, could I just ask you to turn your sound up again, please? Yeah, of course. Please. Um, one second. Gosh, not, it's not very often that people tell me I'm too quiet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll slow down. Um, okay. So what else was I going to say? I guess just before I run out of time, I should talk about the Swarm Hardship Fund. So we, during the pandemic, we ran an emergency hardship fund. Um, we've actually written a report about the fund that was just released this afternoon. So you can find it on our website, or if you look at our various social media, it's up. Um, but it just kind of explains what we did and how we did it, which is basically a group of initially five and then 10 of us ran a fund for sex workers impacted by COVID-19. And we gave out just slightly over a quarter of a million pounds in grants to 1,255 in-person sex workers across the UK. Um, and I'm going to say that again because it's something I'm like deeply proud of that we raised and then gave away like such an extraordinary amount of money and put it directly into the hands of sex workers. Um, but we also did it with a system that was based on trust. So it wasn't based on people having to explain themselves or to justify their need, but on a community coming together and helping each other out. And you know, with the pandemic, a lot of sex workers suddenly lost their income basically overnight with no idea about when it would come back. Sex workers can't be furloughed, can't get sick pay, very rarely have employment rights. Um, you know, switching to work online isn't an option for all sex workers, particularly parents or those without an internet or camera. Um, you know, there's lots of sex workers who have no recourse to public funds, a lot of sex workers who are already on universal credit and it's just not enough. Um, so I don't know, I'm quite cautious about trotting out horror stories about people's lives to sort of try and make a political point. But suffice to say, like a lot, a lot, a lot of sex workers were in a really bad situation, um, especially in March and April. And I, I don't think I have the words to adequately address the rage that I feel um, that, you know, the kind of result of a decade of austerity this rage that I feel like state incompetence and sometimes outright cruelty. Um, there was a moment a couple months ago 
where I read an article about how the government were cutting payments to people who had gone through the national referral mechanism for modern slavery. So they put all this time and money into so-called anti-trafficking policies that are really just anti-immigration policies. You know, if they really cared about labor exploitation, why have they spent decades stripping legal protections from workers? And then they turn around during this unprecedented global pandemic and tell the people who they're meant to be saving or helping that they're not gonna give them any support. And I think in that moment, that just like kind of really broke me, like that cruelty. Um, I just think that people deserve so much better. We deserve to be able to live with dignity and deserve to live without this daily fear of like, how will I survive? And right now in this country, that's not what's happening. And every day there's these new policies and programs and ideologies unveiled that was only gonna make life worse for so many people. Um, anyway, I know I'm meant to be talking about mutual aid and what we've done, I'll finish up, but the groups that I'm a part of have done really amazing things. Like I'll switch back to that, you know, LRU supporting renters, Bent bars supporting queer and trans people inside and outside of prison, Swarm supporting sex workers facing destitution and making it possible to get through um, even just a couple of weeks. And there's so many other groups like the QD BIPOC Fund, mutual aid networks across the country, the Nally so Nanny Solidarity Fund, um, the Fund for International Students who've kind of been left stranded, um, Cooperation Town giving food parcels to hundreds of people. You know, there were people starting up homeless shelters off of nothing. Like people came through, like we came through and we fucking did shit. And in the meantime, the government basically just left us to die. So like, I don't know, I guess I'll end on like, fuck the government. And I'm glad that we have each other because we like literally have nothing else. Thank you, Elio. That's such a good place to end. Um, I'm just gonna pause. We're gonna pause for a moment because our BSL interpreters are going to switch. And then we'll hear from Kelsey, just in a moment. Yeah, ready when you are. Great, um, thank you so much, um, Elio, uh, and so much for your, for your amazing work. Um, and thank you to Lola for hosting this and Livy and Autograph for, for inviting uh, Cape and Cradle to be part of this panel. Um, I guess I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of what abolitionist work is focused on and kind of like what's informing our strategy at the moment. Um, sorry, my dog is next to me as well. Um, and uh, I am gonna talk a little bit about the kind of, you know, this panel is about public health and really like this, this integration that's happening between the prison system and public health at the moment. Um, in this really uh, sinister way. But first I want to talk a little bit about like, cause in the UK, um, you know, I think it's important to, to understand the web that is the, the PIC, the prison industrial complex, or maybe the punishment industrial complex um, uh, to really understand that not only does the UK have the largest prison population in Europe, um, a quarter of which is black and brown people, um, as well as um, a huge amount of people in, in immigration detention and mental health detention. Um, but also there are these, there are these, uh, these connections that are forming and, and being built and strengthened in, in this way that makes it seem like prisons are um, that prison system is somehow concerned with the public health and public safety rather than, than punishment. So these kinds of things that we're seeing of developing new types of prisons for 12 to 17 year olds, so young people, children, um, that's a, a partnership between the Ministry of Justice and the Department for Education um, to act like there's some way that we can make that an educational space um, when you've already had it to the point where a child has been excluded from school and excluded from society in that way, um, that somehow that can be a, an educational space. We have um, private companies, Circo, Sodexo and G4S running prisons, but also operating within our hospitals, our universities, our schools. Um, you know, it, it's Circo that's going to be taken over Public Health England, essentially. Um, but they also provide the, the catering and, and a lot of the services within the prison system. That's both our public prisons and our, um, our private ones. Um, we have probation services providing the services for addiction support, um, things like that, where criminalization is connected, is your route to these kinds of support. Um, 
And we have things like the Domestic Violence and Abuse Bill, which I think is a real example of the way that violence against women is used to drive incarceration, is used as a, um, a political concern that is able to increase incarceration, increase punishment, um, because that bill is mostly focused on um, longer sentences for perpetrators and not for uh, emergency housing or long-term for so support for survivors. And that, and that is really, really evident that those interests are really entwined because Liz Trust, who is now a, our, our, um, our head of our Minister for Equalities, for Women's, women's and Equalities, um, whatever that, that uh, title is, I think it's Women's and Equalities, um, she used to be the head of the Ministry of Justice, she used to be the head of the CPS, so those, those things are very much um, connected and, and uh, you know, we can't stop just looking at the UK, we have to also understand that the Imperial Arm of Britain is still very much keeping a hold of its colonies through funding the arms trade internationally and controlling trade, aid and debt to the point where they even tried to build a prison in Nigeria recently. That's not going ahead, but these kinds of things show the way that punishment is very much live um, as well as if we look at things like the war on drugs. Um, uh, so um, I really want to talk about the fact that we just, we need to uh, work to challenge a state that prioritizes and, and uh, you know, the, uh, sorry. yeah, that prioritizes punishment over care. Um, and we have to understand that those mechanisms of punishment, um, where punishment functions as a way of keeping you where you're supposed to be within the capitalist structure, um, that that punishment works through prisons and policing, yes, but it also works through education, through housing scarcity, through immigration control, through poverty, through healthcare, social care systems, the mental health system, and your violent support services. That while we have um, mandatory reporting and while we have safeguarding rules that integrate the, the police system um, into lots of our frontline services, that punishment is, is the flip side to any support that we may receive. Um, so CAPE's um, work against prison expansion is really coming up against this, like I said, this integration of, of prisons and, and public health. And something else that made this really evident in this last six months is the way that the government decided to take a criminalization approach to public health, to this public, to this public health crisis. You know, the, the idea that you could police COVID um, rather than provide the, the care and the housing and the, the um, support that we needed um, is, is bizarre, right? But really betrays their agenda. So, um, you know the fact even just moving from stay home to stay alert suddenly we're all we're all on the lookout for covid and to, to police each other right um but we know that uh the laws around lockdown meant that um black and brown people were um stopped and searched 17 times more likely uh, more often under covid laws than than white people we know that they were 54 percent more likely to be fined we know that fines are only something that's uh, going to impact poor people that rich people can deal with a fine and they'll they'll be okay but we also know that the areas that were being policed were not the parks that mostly rich white people go to we know that there was just an excuse to uh, criminalize more particularly young black people um, but also to criminalize people People who are not safe in their homes and people who have to work um, outside of the law um, and uh, and at the same time domestic violence rates were going up so the idea that police keep us safe even in the best of times let alone that they were going to keep us safe during this pandemic was just a false narrative that really carried through a way to make it seem like the government was really doing something about this virus when actually um, they're not, you know, and they're just pursuing the same agenda that they were the whole time. Um, I think something else that it really brought up for me as well was was the uh, it, this was a moment where we really needed to come through for each other, that we needed to build these networks of care, of mutual aid, to support each other. But there was a huge, not everyone, but there was a huge population of, of the Britain who were very keen to call the police on their neighbors for um, breaking lockdown rules. And to the point where the police didn't even want all those calls, you know? Um, and I think that that's really telling because 
uh, we really need to kill the cops in our head, as they say, and we really need to think about not just uh, blaming people who that we who we don't know, but actually are we being um, cautious and, and careful with the people that we do know? Are we ensuring that they have what they need to stay home? Um, all of these things, are we actually having those conversations with the people close to us, or are we just looking outside at young people that we already don't like um, and calling the cops on them? So these kinds of things were really highlighted to me like during, during the pandemic. Um, but in terms of, and so that's kind of like on the street, but um, in terms of public health during COVID as well, like prisons are a public health crisis anyway. Like the, the prison population is dynamic. It, that means that it's not just that there's some people who are in prison and they just stay there and they're away from society, which is what the state and the narrative kind of wants you to believe. But most people are, are serving less than 12 months. Most people are gonna leave prison at some point. There is no separation between like us and them. And so like an issue that's happening within prison is something that's happening within our society. And so yes, prisons are a hotbed for viruses, but they're also a hotbed for chronic illness, for sexual violence, for coercion and control. Um, they are, um, places where all of these issues are able to persist and by not containing the virus uh, within the prisons that also was going to have impacts for people outside but by not uh, understanding the way that we could have supported people in that moment um, and just relying on further punishment. Basically, I guess not everyone knows, the, the government's response to COVID when it came to prisons was to completely lock them down, was to cut off any visitation. Um, as Elio said, they made it much harder for posts to get in and out, um, you know, really, really increasing the amount of isolation that people experienced inside. Um, while the staff are still going in and out, of course, and not required to necessarily wear PPE, not provided with PPE, no, and no social distancing enforced inside. So um, we know that uh, actually reducing visitation and all these kinds of things were not the thing that was going to reduce the spread of the virus inside. And we know that actually what it was doing was making people more vulnerable to the virus, more vulnerable to uh, long-term uh, health and um, mental health impacts um, because of that lockdown. And we will be seeing those consequences for a long time, whether the government wants to admit it or not. Um, just because people are, are in prison doesn't mean that they are actually out of sight, out of mind. The ways that you can, even under their own um, rules, you know, people had their sentences ex extended because of the virus, because of lockdown, the ways that that can have impacts on people's mental health, on their communities outside, on how long it might take you to get back on your feet when you leave, all of these things um, increased by the fact that suddenly you're being kept inside. And and by the way, like, that was regardless of whether you're a non-violent or violent offender, right? Like that, the, the virus doesn't care and the government actually doesn't care. Once you are criminalized and once you're in that system, they can change the rules like that. And that's what we learned about this virus. And they can change the rules to increase oppression. What they didn't want to do, there wasn't the political will, unlike lots of other countries, to, to do mass releases, which is what was the only thing that would have alleviated the, the risks inside. And there wasn't that political will. And even though we had many, many NGOs and even prison governors themselves saying, what we need to do in this pandemic is to let people out. And the housing was not provided and the mechanisms were not provided for people to be able to leave. Um, and instead they went for increase the, increase the violence inside and people were locked in for 23 hours plus a day. Um, you know, regardless of, of what they're in for or how long they're supposed to be in there for. Um, and it, it's just been really horrible, you know. Um, and after being failed over and over during this, this crisis by the government, rather than learning that, that what we need is, is healthcare and housing that's accessible for everyone, um, what we're seeing is the NHS being sold off and private companies being contracted out to build four new prisons. Um, and that's part of the economic recovery plan. And if we're gonna, if, yeah, we should be highly, highly concerned um, and, and deeply resistant to a system that moves to, to increase control and imprisonment during a crisis instead of, instead of increasing our capacity for collective care and community um, resources. And I think this just really showed that the agenda of public health and of public safety is, to maintain and protect the upper classes and to maintain the status quo. It shows us again, who is excluded when we speak about public health and public safety. Um, 
And yeah, it's just, it for me, like it's no wonder that a country with the highest prison population in Europe also has the highest death rate from COVID. You know, this is deeply about how our, our state uh, considers our population and our um, and what care looks like and who they'll provide care for. Um, and so for me, abolition really allows us to, to start visioning beyond this incredibly violent system to, to start building these networks of mutual aid and collective care and transformative justice. Um, and it really is a mission that requires us to put energy and resources into those things, um, which this pandemic has just, has just uh, exacerbated and accelerated that need, I think. Um, but what it's also shown with this global pandemic is is our interconnectedness and, and our interdependence, right? And not just in the UK, but worldwide. And so we have to, we have to just really strengthen our capacity for care, our, our networks um, to resist violence from the state and, and within our communities. Uh, and we have to really start to think about, um, yeah, what that looks like across borders, because because we're we're not just by ourselves here, you know. And I think more than anything, this time is really showing that. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I think um, what you did really well was show how a, a, a carceral politics is always within reach, right? The state is always trying to shore up. Um, that cultural politics and what would it mean to start from this idea that the world is already always a disaster for someone right that the thinking about coronavirus as this like uh, point zero this crisis what would it mean to to begin um, from an understanding that so many people currently in the conditions that we're living in live in a state of crisis right and so this only exacerbates it um, next we have um, Dr. Avia Day Hey, can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Cool. Um, thank you so much for um, having me on this panel. Um, yeah, it's shaping up to be a pretty incredible discussion already. So I'm feel very honored to be here. Um, yeah, so like I'm involved in um, Sisters Uncut and I'm gonna speak a little bit about um, Sisters Uncut and his Sisters Uncut's history and um, the relationship with Sisters Uncut towards like mutual aid, direct action and abolitionist politics. And then also more recently since COVID started, um, I've also been involved in the UK Mutual Aid Network um, as well as um, London Renters Union, specifically um, the rent strike that's been happening at Summerford Grove in Dalston. So I'm gonna to touch on those things a little bit as well. Um, but just to like start off, um, so yeah, Sisters Uncut, um, been going now for five years which is pretty amazing um, but yeah started as a group of activists and survivors and uh, people working in the domestic violence sector um, back in 2014 when the austerity measures really had started to um, kick in and people started to uh, notice just how little was left of our welfare state and how few options people had in terms of um, being able to escape violence and, and to be able to access safety. Um, and so like, that's where the idea came from. Um, just to, on a personal note, um, you know, I wanted to be part of um, taking direct action around violence against women and state violence because of my own history. And, you know, growing up as a kid like violence against women was a really normal part of of my my environment it was um everywhere i can't remember you know anyone any woman in my community not experiencing domestic or sexual violence in one form or another and um a lot of the reason why i do the work that i do today um and one of the most like you know biggest things that happened in my childhood was when my um best friend's mom was murdered by her dad uh, when I was nine years old on my estate and it you know really deeply traumatized me and and impacted me deeply for many years and probably I would still say it does because that's why I do what I do um and even after that you know I went on to end up staying in a women's refuge myself being homeless living in bed and breakfast and you know it just built up this picture in my life of like you know just never ending relationship between 
um, individual violence and also the, the the state and and you know this this perpetual kind of like failure of being made homeless and and being precarious um, because of this individualized violence, but also this state violence. Um, to the point where, you know, when I got older, I really wanted to do something about it. And that's why I wanted to be part of Sisters Uncut. And um, just, yeah, to give you an impression of, of who we are, um, as Lola introduced, we um, started off fighting cuts to domestic violence services. And over the years, we've kind of grown into a, a prison abolitionist um, uh, network that also, uh, you know, seeks the answers to violence against women and to domestic and sexual violence through transformative justice and outside of the, the um, prisons and um, the prison industrial complex. Um, but yeah, once we, we started in 2014, initially we had a lot of like stunt actions, like, you know, taking the red carpet at the, um, uh, the um, premiere of the film Suffragette, um, with the tagline dead women can't vote and um, kind of blew up from there and kind of you know ended up with uh, a national network all over the country with groups and that's when we kind of moved away from the model of doing these stunt based actions to, to get lots of like media attention to our cause to something much more like community based um, so I'm just going to give like a couple of examples of that um, of East End Sisters Uncuts um, organizing as well as um, North London Sisters um, organizing. So yeah, in East London Sisters, we took and um, we occupied an empty council flat in Hackney to protest the fact that there were 1,000 empty council flats in the borough. Um, we took that property for three months um, and also ended up organizing very deeply with the um, women in that community um, who were in temporary accommodation, were you know, being treated really badly by Hackney, and they basically became activists um, as well, um, and became part of our campaign, and we became became part of their campaign, and we like shared a lot of information between us, um, shared like training, um, and built up, I guess, a, a sort of mutual aid network of support, so that everyone there had someone who was um, could be there for them and their housing needs and to um, go to appointments and 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 make sure that um, what they uh, needed was met um, and one of the most like you know in terms of talking about direct action which I probably will speak a bit more about in a bit um, one of the like most heartening things that happened was when the kids actually started organizing like it breeded it spread this like atmosphere of taking action for what you felt was right and, and without any kind of um, prompting or anything like that, the kids decided to start organizing because their playground on the estate had been closed all summer. And um, they asked to come to one of our meetings with the mayor and like, we didn't know what for, they just like, you know, said basically they'd gone around to all the kids, got a petition, stood up in front of the mayor and were like, we want our playground, it's not safe for us. The older kids have to look after the little kids. And it was like amazing action um spreading that you can actually t like take back control of, of of your surroundings and what's happening to you um and i'm going to speak a little bit as well about like how we came to an abolitionist kind of understanding of our politics too um so yeah like i said we started off um organizing against austerity and um it came clear through a lot of our organizing many of us were um act accessing domestic violence services or working in the sector itself that while the welfare state was being decimated a lot of that money was actually being invested much more in the criminal justice system and criminal justice responses to domestic violence and um, one of the things my phd research also looked at was the fact that actually this um even though the idea was to like arrest all the perpetrators what was actually happening was that domestic violence services um domestic violence survivors were being arrested either for immigration enforcement issues or um, for defending themselves against their perpetrator. And so uh, as we like were noticing this more and more, it seemed really important to start centering the fact that like, OK, we can fight against austerity, but they're investing all of that money into the criminal justice system and, and using violence against women as a reason, as Kelsey was saying, to um, to increase prison sentences. Um, um, and and that's having an enormous impact on survivors. And so 
um yeah one of the actions that um that um the biggest actions that was taken um around this was um the occupation of holloway and north london sisters and um it was amazing it was something that you know like actually happened after um holloway had closed down um which posed a bit of a tricky issue in terms of like prison abolition because you know what actually happened was the women in that uh, prison were not released. Um, they were distributed all over the country, uh, far away from their networks. But the prison did close down and there was a local campaign um, with groups um, such as Reclaim Holloway um, to try and get that site be um, made into um, social housing in a women's building. And Sisters Ankar occupied with those, um, with those uh, uh, demands in mind. And um, it was a part, like a partial victory. Um, you know, the in, initial plan had been to turn it into luxury flats. Peabody was given a loan by the mayor to buy that um, uh, site, and the women's building has been, you know, um, earmarked for it. However, there is, you know, basically they want it to be criminal justice focused. So, like, it's a partial victory in some ways. However, the fight is not over because the the Holloway community want that to be a women's building that is a testament to, um, uh, well, everything that has happened um, there um, in terms of like the criminal justice system um, and the past, and they want it to be community led, um, and that's really really important to maintain that. Um, so yeah, the fight is still on. And just to finish our, um, up, talk to just talk about like COVID nineteen and like the organising that I've been doing more recently. I've been involved in um, the COVID nineteen response, COVID nineteen mutual aid response to the pandemic, um, which has been an amazing lesson for me and in, in in the power of mutual aid and how. And this is something I can talk about a little bit more um, later. But like how. At, efficient and how the possibilities outside the state of what the community can actually do like that we actually do have the skills and the capacity to look after one another just in our local community just in our street we like we can do this um and even though it's been kind of um shocking the the level of neglect um that the state has been willing to perpetrate against communities. It's been amazing to see how communities have been able to respond and support each other and make it known that um, they will use whatever they can to, to support each other. And um, yeah, lastly, with London Renters Union, um, and there's been a number of, the, um, a number of different um, examples of this where people have been faced with homelessness, losing their jobs because of COVID-19, not being able to pay their rent, and um, in um, Dalston, Summerford Grove, a group of renters um, have um, been organising to get a rent reduction um, in a very large building that is um, owned by a billionaire who, um, rather than, you know, because he can afford it, giving them the rent reduction has um, been using a lot of intimidation tactics. Um, but it's, you know, an amazing campaign, which I think if it can um, win, would have huge ramifications for the rest of Hackney to get um, a big rent reduction. Um, it's quite rare to have um, a whole block owned by one billionaire landlord, so it's a massive opportunity um, to, to, to win against a landlord. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think I went a little bit over time, but um, yeah. <laughs> That's okay, thank you so much, Avia. And hopefully we'll have time to um, kind of unpick uh, some of your points in the, in the q and I'm just gonna pause a second so our um, BSL interpreters can switch. Great. Um, so in terms of questions, um, I wanted to start maybe by collapsing two kind of chunky questions together um, and to ask you, what would a public health um, approach or, yeah, what would a public health approach that was orientated towards the living look like? And by that, I mean, especially in this moment um, in terms of coronavirus, in terms of like uh, police brutality, conversations around Black Lives Matter, for example, we're, we're constantly, you know, talking about justice and we're constantly talking about justice after the fact, right? Justice after um, somebody has died. And so what would it mean to have a, a radical public health approach um, and get beyond this idea that, that public health is something that the state bestows upon us and move to a more kind of active community-based uh, approach to providing it for one another? 
Uh, go on, Elia. I can chime in. I love to chime in. Um, I think, I guess, hang on a second. I think starting, starting with like an idea of what public health is, is maybe like a place that makes sense to me and thinking of public health, not as this like state administered thing, but as collective health, uh, you know, public thing, health is the thing that makes us well. And there's this idea of health as either being, you know, healthy or unhealthy, like something you switch between rather than the spectrum you exist along. And, you know, health isn't an object we either have or we don't, it's this relationship to wellness. Um, so, you know, I don't know, as much as I rate the NHS, um, there's these kind of Western medical traditions that are about identifying and resolving symptoms. Oh, you have anxiety. Oh, you have respiratory problems. Oh, you have this. We'll give you medication. We'll give you counseling. And these things are good. Like we should have these things in abundance if we need them. But we should also be looking at those underlying systemic factors that I think is kind of what you're talking about or getting at, right? Like what are the things that cause these health issues? The poverty, the racism, the poor housing, and like how they work towards it. And so thinking about like a public health oriented that's like about living and like a, a full life, I think I come back to that abundance. Like I'm really stoked on this idea of abundance at the moment. Um, there's this, you know, conversation about defund the police happening. And I absolutely think we should defund the police, you know, abolish a lot of them. I guess I can't decide whether we should defund the police or, you know, abolish the police or abolish the prisons first. Which order do we do it in? Maybe at the same time. But like a lot of that conversation comes down to having to convince people that it's because the money is better spent elsewhere on social housing or community projects or on support services. And we end up in this kind of austerity conversation. Um, a friend of mine calls it the balancing the household budget conversation where we're saying spend it like this and the Tories are saying no spend it like this. And then there's kind of deadlock about this portion of money that's imagined to be limited. And I understand strategically that argument, like I think it's important and it cuts across to people and explains to people a way of thinking about policing and safety. But I sometimes wonder if maybe we could like move our conversation or like what would happen if our conversation was about imagining abundance, you know, being able to imagine spending state money whimsically for the benefit of the people and in search of joy and of like expansive hopeful lives. Um, though I don't know, maybe that's what people thought they were doing with like the British empire, so that's not good, but like maybe this question of like a public health oriented towards living would look at what kind of lives we want to lead, not just those that we can scratch by in and not those that rob others of well-being of joy, but like health as something that is like an expansive, full, rich life. I don't know. Does that kind of answer? Yeah, no, that's an excellent answer. And I think it really gets at this point that um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore makes of like the doctrine of least eligibility, this idea that there's this like every dollar you have is a dollar that somebody else doesn't have right like and moving away from that thinking towards this idea of abundance really kind of guts the conversation in terms of there's only a finite amount of resources or amount of money we have does anyone else want to come in on that yeah I was gonna um yeah I was thinking I've been thinking a lot about like the history of um, like how uh, communities have dealt with health outside of the state and you know it's quite tricky as leftists to be too critical of the National Health Service because in many ways we feel quite lucky to have it and um, we're constantly having to defend it and the people that are critiquing it are usually coming at it from the position of the like of um, you know right-wing kind of politics um and they want to basically sell the nhs so like it's quite tricky sometimes to engage in critique around um state-based health but one of the things like historically that I found really interesting is like long time before the nhs was around how people um how workers were able to like meet each other's needs in terms of health um in this country was around things like friendly societies which were set up where uh, workers would pay like a premium and they would employ their own doctor for their community or their like their workers and um you know this was actually something that you know like once the state started to really get involved they um insisted had to be stamped out and one of the reasons like the british medical association started a massive campaign against these friendly societies because they uh, despised the fact that there was this accountability where if you know these people were paying for this doctor and they employed them and therefore they told their doctor what they wanted rather than the doctor telling them what to do and they felt that the doctor needed to tell people what to do. And so that needed to be stamped out. And another example, um, which I've been reading about recently, the Peckham Health Centre, which was around from the 20s to the 50s, and it didn't actually last very long after the NHS came in. Um, 
again, based on this idea um, that Elia was talking about, like a holistic understanding of health that isn't just about the absence of disease in your body, mm-hmm. but is also about your environment, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So like, you know, they were looking at, you know, familial health, like what is going on in your home, like looking at the root causes of issues. And again, it was it was paid for um, with money, um, you know, like um, contributory um, on a contributory basis. And it had no hierarchy. So there was one person who had authority and that person's only job was to ensure that no one else was um you know, using their authority against anyone. So if there was like doctors or whatever that they weren't um, weaponizing their status in some in some kind of way against community members, that was the only person that had authority. And again, it didn't last very long after the NHS because of this contributory um, kind of aspect to it, you know, um, post the NHS was considered um, an impediment to the idea of universal healthcare. But actually, you know, if you think about the the level of bureaucracy and the lack of accountability that we have in terms of our doctors, that actually what they were trying to do through that contributory system is that, you know, if you've got, you know, your local healthcare system and you're putting money into it, um, then, and you know who your doctor is and they're accountable to you, you know, that's a very different system than what, what we've got today, which is like, God knows what is going on with your NHS trust or how how the hell do you like achieve accountability? How the hell do you achieve um, knowing like, you know, what your your health trust priorities are and, and making sure that it is in line with what you, you think your community should be, you know? And that's what they were trying to get at. And it, yeah, unfortunately, the, the bureaucracy of the state stamped it out very quickly, but I think it's interesting to go back to these examples in the past before the state got involved and like starting to imagine, you know, what might be um, what might might be possible, really. Um, So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's really crucial to to think that um, to remember that things haven't always been this way. Right. And I think it's especially poignant um, now that we see that public health England is might be replaced by some kind of privatized other. Right. Um, I want to do two questions at once, just so that we have um, time. Um, Kelsey, I, I wanted to ask you, um, what connects the struggle for uh, uh, kind of like prison abolition with sex workers' rights, right? How how are the figure of the sex worker and the figure of the prisoner related by a, a kind of carceral politics? And also, I, I wanted to ask all of you um, about this thing about care, right? I, I think about this constantly about how care is often seen, I think in the, on the left, on the left especially as a kind of incomplete methodology for revolution, right? Like it's, it's somehow seen as like not robust enough. Um, and we're constantly asking questions about how to scale up mutual aid. So I, I, I wanna ask you about building and sustaining infrastructures of care outside of state structures and how we kind of build a public consciousness to understand that some of us are locked outside of the scope of the, the state's protection. What do we do with care? How do we utilize it? How do we expand it essentially? So there, there are two questions there. Um, Kelsey, do you wanna go first? Yeah, um, I think it's, Uh, It's a really great question. And I think that uh, the reality of criminalization is is that what it does, no matter the kind of like seriousness of the crime, there's a level of removing your humanity, your dignity, your agency. And that's something that we see like removed from sex workers uh, in the narrative, like constantly, right? And, And a lot of saviorism around around sex workers um, and the work being done there, but uh, the criminal is kind of, yeah, this person that uh, no longer is deserving of being able to make their own choices and uh, no longer being able to, you know, be part of society in in an acceptable way. Um, And I think that there's so much connection there. The way that we create punishment as a way of supposedly protecting other people who might not even want that punishment. You know what I mean? Like once um, violence has been, it's taken out of your hands and once the the state gets a hold of it, they will decide to prosecute regardless of whether you want that or not, even if you're the victim. Um, And we see this, we see this all the time. But I think that, uh, yeah, there's just a, this like ongoing connection between how we perceive people who are in prison who as we've seen with COVID like 
just completely not worth saving, you know? And I think that we we have so much work to do to, to disrupt those narratives and really think about what it is to, to have agency, what it is to understand that we have to create those networks of care outside of the state, right? Which mm -hmm. the Sex Workers Fund has shown that like those networks exist. Um, and it is frequently people who already have to exist outside of, um, outside of state structures who have to find that support for each other who who created those systems for a long time and that's black and brown people that's that's queer people that's disabled people all these people who are also overrepresented in in the criminal justice system ellie do you want to come in on that as well love to come in on that because mm. i think the sex worker rights movement have been calling for abolition for decades right and when i say abolition i mean like the abolition abolition of prisons policing all these different things you know when we say we demand decriminalization and like an end to police harassment we're saying the police are not useful to sex workers they don't help you know stop funding them to be involved in sex worker lives when we say stop criminalizing sex workers and stop criminalizing clients we're saying that prisons are not useful tools for ending violence against sex workers um, there's this really good uh, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore quote that kind of talks about racism as the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And this kind of idea of states producing premature death is done through things like putting people in prison or creating conditions of poverty where people turn to sex work or policing specific communities in certain ways. Um, someone who's involved in Swarm, Lydia, um, she wrote a really good tweet earlier today talking about how the Nordic model is the kind of conclusion you come to when you view sex work through the lens of something that clients inflict on us rather than something mm. to survive. Mm, mm, mm. Punishing clients over meeting sex worker needs is an act of making workers invisible. And these carceral tools that are used, you know, to end demand for sex workers exist in the same world as, as putting people in prison as a way to respond to harm. You know, it's all focused on punishment rather than on supporting people's lives. You know, you actually abolish sex work through, not through criminalization, but through abolishing the conditions that make exploitative labor necessary. Um, and so that kind of what you're talking about is care is like, why do we do it? Why do we care? It's because if we believe in abolition, if we believe in ending these systems of exploitation, we have to build a, a, an alternative. Not, I, I mean, I don't really like the term idea of alternative because it's kind of like things on, on balance against each other, but we have to build conditions in which people can survive and thrive so that we can abolish all the other bullshit because we make it unnecessary. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that was so great. Um, I'm just gonna pause so that our BSL interpreters can switch. We good? Great. Um, uh, Avia, do you want to come in on that point about um, care and mutual aid and scaling up um, those kind of projects? Yeah, it's definitely something I've been thinking about a lot over the last few months. Like, um, as I was saying earlier, having a little window into the capacity that we have um, within communities like you know it, it has got me really thinking and reflecting you know I've always been a big believer in mutual aid but I just I guess I didn't know it would be like you know we could operationalize it so quickly and so efficiently I just did you know it's been amazing to see it um, but also you know it's important to sort of recognize um, as people have, have, have discussed already you know that a lot of the issues that have um, been massively exasperated by this pandemic existed before um you know poverty and isolation and um you know um ill health and uh, it, you know people not being able to access what they need because of their immigration and all of these things existed before but the pandemic has brought it into very very harsh and sharp focus mm, mm. um so you know whether the pandemic is here or not doesn't mean you know those those issues are not going away so it is incredibly important now we've like established that we can um work together and then we can um support each other through our community networks that we build something more sustainable um, and 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 build up healthy um, communities. So you know, in my mind, I feel like you know it's important to have um, 
in the future um, to have bases to work from, to have social centres where the work around people's benefits, around um, confronting landlords, around, you know, like renters union stuff, benefits union stuff, like all of those stuff where, where communities can actually use mutual aid in terms of supporting one another with issues that they have faced and then help someone else with that when with the with the skills that they've learned so that it's not based on charity it's not based on you turning up somewhere and 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 them sorting out that one issue that you had um but actually people um gaining the skills to learn how to do that themselves and then pass that on to other people that are facing the same issues and that's building you know that's kind of you know you might consider like dual power so like it's not only addressing those issues but you're building up the capacity and the health of that community so that you know eventually when the time comes you know you can seize power <laughs> um you know so i think yeah i think it will be important to to look over the next year or two to be um doing a lot of this work from bases and building up much more um uh, power within communities around around that work. I think, yeah, I think a long term strategy strategy is really necessary. I wanted to also um, ask all of you in terms of the organizing work that you do about your orientation in terms of working against and beyond the state simultaneously and what that means for you and how it's inflected um, depending on what your demands are, if that makes any sense. Um, I think it's, it's, I think, you know, organizers often say that we're working, you know, um, against and beyond simultaneously, but often we don't really kind of unpick what that means and how it like can cause conflict because obviously in the short term in the urgency of the situation we we do need to many people need to rely on um on provisions or resources that the state offers and so it's in our interest to procure those for them but it's also within our interest to kind of like create an argument for or to build a bigger vision that that takes us entirely away from and beyond um what the state can offer us so how how do you sit with those with that idea in the work that you do um elio do you want to go first uh sure um i i think it can be complicated for the sex worker rights movement in that you know we're making these demands of the state in terms of decriminalization but that demand is for like the removal of the state from sex worker lives um so it's kind of like towards the state but it's also like to a, it's kind of like a, a request to abolish the state, or at least that's my perspective on it. I'm sure many other people have different views. Um, but I think, I don't know, I was thinking about this because we were, you know, the panels about kind of rights and human rights and, or is that's the context of it. And I was thinking about this question in relation to that. Um, and there was a panel at the Swarm Conference last year um, and this person called Make a Vent Adrift was talking about radical transfeminism and sort of the difference between liberty and liberation, which I think kind of relates to this. You know, and she sort of talked about how liberty means civil rights and that like rights is kind of a, a curbing of the managerial class, but on their own terms. So it's talking to the managerial class in the language of the management, you know, talking to the manager in the voice of the management, talking to the management in the voice of the manager, um, but that rights will never set us free. So working with the state, you know, it's never going to set us free. I think abolishing the state is what will set us free, but that's, you know, my specific political perspective. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of the groups I'm a part of when I say that. You know, we need rights because they're useful. I was talking to someone earlier today about how the UK kind of human rights framework limits how many people the government can deport and in what circumstances they can do that. But at the same time, they aren't liberation. They aren't the fundamental change to the society that we need. They're this neoliberal construct that can also be used in violent ways. like and used to you know, expand the carceral state, like hate crime legislation that increases police funding and stuff like that. So, I mean, I wish I had an answer to this because then I think if I had an answer, then we would like kind of be sorted. Like we could all just leave the call and go home. Not that I'm saying my answer would be the thing that we did. Um, but like, I think it is really complicated, but I do think that like in the political landscape that we're in, we just have to be against the state. Um, the Tories aren't gonna give us what we need. They're not, it's just not gonna happen. We're gonna spend the next five years with everything just getting like worse and worse and worse. Like Keir Starmer is not um, a solution to any problems and looking towards the state and to electoral politics and to political parties is not gonna be what happens. It will be through these mutual aid projects that we do. 
And I think it's fucked that we can't rely on a welfare state, that we have to do it for ourselves. You know, it's becoming more and more like the United States where like there's this hyper capitalism, this hyper self-reliance, but like it is what we have to do. And we need to do that in ways where we're like holding each other and taking care of each other. Because like, to me, it's not even about can we work with the state? It's that the state has abandoned us. And so now we need to act together. That was a great answer. <laughs> um, go, um, yeah, yeah, go on, go on, Nubia. Um, yeah, I, this is like a big question for me, like within and against the state. It's something that like is a really good question and a really hard one to like answer and figure out a lot of the time. And I think like as revolutionaries, you know, it's, it's very difficult, you know, to, you know, very few of us can actually live a life, you know, with outside of the institutions of capitalism we have to work with them to some extent and it's figuring out a way as revolutionaries to do that in a way that isn't just about reformism um but you know at the end of the day we do have to figure out a way to operate in these institutions on a day-to-day -day basis um and yeah i think that like for me i think one of the things that is really important to center and remember is that like when we're talking about um abolition for me that means revolution it doesn't just mean um abolishing one institution it means a revolution against capitalism and when we're talking about the prison industrial complex you know for me what i'm talking about is one facet of capitalism that needs to be dismantled um along with all the other institutions that prop up capitalism and i think you know it's important when we're working with institutions to keep that sight in mind and not lose and not lose sight of that um, and I'm kind of like minded of like a tweet that I wrote yesterday, like someone <laughs> wrote a really strange tweet that kind of, for me, kind of encapsulates some of the problems of how people can think they're being radical, but have actually become institutionalized and, and limited by their institutions in, in their scope and their imagination. And there's this guy basically, you know, saying, calling out people who want to abolish private schools and, um, you know, saying, oh, academics who want to pr abolish private schools, but are you prepared to go as far as abolishing Russell Group universities? And I was just like, that's it? Like, you're, so you're, call you're calling out, you're calling out what is ostensibly a radical position to, uh, to abolish private schools with your liberal limited position to abolish Russell Group, abolish the whole university. Abolish, this, abolish, abolish capitalism. This is what happens when you become institutionalized. This is what happens when you've become so limited and the, the kind of ways in which um, institutions minimize our, um, um, our, our imaginations and, 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 and our um, capabilities in being able to see what is possible to these reformist and liberal positions, which we think, which many people may think are, are radical, but really are not, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's really crucial to keep in mind that when we're talking about abolition, we're talking about revolution. I feel like that is really crucial. And I feel like sometimes that is a little bit missing from a lot of the conversation here is that we're not just gonna talk about, um, you know, overthrowing the prison industrial complex. We're talking about overthrowing all of the institutions that um, prop up capitalism, including schools, including um, universities and starting again in terms of an education system, a health system and, um, um justice within our communities that centers our needs yeah i think in many ways we're talking about like the end of the world as we know it which is why you know abolition is not a popular idea <laughs> in, in some senses um kelsey do you want to come in there? uh yeah thank you like i i want to echo all of that i guess like in terms of the question of like specifically with campaigns and how and how we deal with these this conflict that that we feel like yeah I think it's it's always like knowing what the overall aim is um and understanding as they say that we don't want to have to um dismantle something later we're not going to like fight for stuff that we're going to have to undo at a later time um so understanding how we use lots of these mechanisms and these campaigns to remove resources and build capacity for us to be doing these things ourselves and how we can campaign for structures that will allow us to meet like both immediate needs 
and also like build towards that future vision. And it, it is really difficult with prisons, right? Because prisons are a very specific thing and people are literally locked inside and we cannot actually just get in and free people or we cannot, like there is a level of, like the state has so much control over a certain population um, that sometimes it does feel like begging, you know, and it does feel like you're really struggling with these institutions um, that can feel unsurmountable at times, but, um, you know, it's about building the narrative, building that uh, capacity for us to, um, to, yeah, to change the narrative around the purpose that prisons are serving um, and to make them obsolete, you know, as Angela Davis would say, to really make it so that fewer people are going to prison because we are starting to resist um, policing, but also because we are building our capacity for supporting each other and not actually having to engage with those systems. Um, and I think like, yeah, as long as we are continuing to do that, um, yeah, there are these compromises or these, these moments that can be really difficult. I'm just thinking about with COVID where it just really felt like there's this bottleneck at the top, like we can get everyone on board and there'll just be someone who's advising Boris, who's like, don't let them out. And, and that is really, really shit, you know, and really frustrating because um, you can have all the evidence and all the things, and there is a concentration of power that gets to make certain decisions. But like, it's about getting creative and figuring out the ways that we can challenge those things and challenge the narratives. And, you know, we've seen in the US, like, yes, you can do something huge when you have like a money bail system that is already fucked in all its own ways. But it means that when you get enough money as they have, uh, uh, in the wake of the uprisings that you, you know, some cities where you can literally bail out an entire jail, then you're starting to really challenge a system and then you're going to start to really see some things. But here we have to do it slowly. We have to figure out what these things are. And we are starting to see through mutual aid groups um, and through building these systems of care, we're seeing ways to play the system. If we get good lawyers on our, on our side, um, that we can get people out on compassionate release. If we show one of the like biggest things around like getting people um, released during their appeals um, and their tribunals is is about the care that they have in the community and so keeping people incarcerated relies on the fact that they're not going to be able to access services they're not going to be able to access all these things but if our communities can come and say hey we've got you then we can we can start to challenge that and so that's been the only thing during COVID that started to get people out is this compassionate release stuff and like doing that through mutual aid and things so by getting creative by learning how to play that system and keeping your eye on the ball of like it's about getting people out and it's about not letting them get back in then it's yeah we can I think we can do it but it's it's, it's a constant battle and they are constantly coming up with new ways to to make it seem like maybe they're on your side or maybe things are going in the right direction um and we have to be really really vigilant of those two because linguistically and all these things where they co-opt our language they start to build prisons that are called community units um all these kinds of things like we have to be really really uh, wary thank you so much um i want to just as we round up want to go to some q a um uh oh uh, sorry get to some q a questions um i think first our bsl interpreters want to swap um and the first question uh, um it's kind of more of a comment i guess elio you could speak to this um, Hannah says, I'm wondering if the increased public attention on abolitionist politics as, as a result of the BLM protests in recent months is changing the public conversation about sex work. I've been seeing Nordic model advocates call for defunding the police and I can't tell if they've changed their minds or if they're just confused. I think it's a mixture of the two. I think some people have changed their minds and some people are just confused. Um, or maybe confused is like a really generous way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily increased attention at abolitionist politics that have changed it. Um, I think it's like a combination of things. I think it's like decades of sex worker movement. I think it's the last couple of years where decriminalization of sex work has become like more palatable and more people are seeing like what a failure the Nordic model would be. You know, you look to Ireland and they when they introduced the Nordic model in Northern Ireland, they did a study and then they checked in two years later to see what the consequences had been. And there was a 90% increase in violence towards sex workers. You know, we have evidence that shows that the Nordic model doesn't work. And I think that's starting to people. Um, and I actually also think that what's happened in the last few months did like Swarm responded to the crisis. We raised fuckloads of money and supported mm. 
We provided direct support in a load of different ways and organizations and charities and outreach projects that are funded that have millions of pounds a year, some less, but some that much, like literally did nothing. Like there was crickets. I think one organization tried to post about how they'd handed out 30 different support packages to sex workers. And it was like, cool, that's, you know, great. And like, it is great. I'm glad they did that, but it's just sort of like really illuminated how these groups fail and how they're just these like punishing ideological projects that do nothing to support sex workers. And I think that just becomes clearer every minute that passes. I think there's um, another question I think you could answer. Um, someone says, it's great being reminded of the work of Bent Bars. Are there networks to support black uh, and POC youth in prisons and networks for black prisoners in uh, England and Wales? I guess also Kelsey, you could speak to that as well. Um, the first group that comes to mind of Forefront who are an amazing um, youth project fighting policing um, and should be supported in every way possible. Um, That's absolutely true. For them. Um, to do their really amazing work. That would be the first kind of group that come to mind. I don't know, Kelsey, if you have thoughts about others. Um, like there's not that many sort of like specific, uh, yeah, there's not that many in the UK specifically because capacity has been so low around this issue, but there's, um, the Prisoner Solidarity Network and uh, through CAPE, like it's sort of more informal networks of supporting people um, and campaigns that kind of come through to lots of the abolitionists, but it's not like a specific like network for black folks at the moment. But if people want to set that up, I'm happy to support that. Um, yeah. Can I ask? I was gonna say there's also um, uh, Jengba who organize around um, Joint enterprise, yeah. Joint enterprise, which isn't black only, but they do and it's like of young black men who are impacted though, yeah. Yeah, so. exactly. So um yeah, I think look up let them up because they're a really amazing group who um support a lot of young people who are currently incarcerated. Yeah, totally. Um, I think to round up, I want to ask a final question, um kind of based I guess on on something that I think about constantly, which is the imagination and the political imagination. And Elio, when you were talking about abundance, I was feeling something for the first time. I was like, oh, gosh, um, because I think that like the political imagination or the ability to imagine or the impulse to imagine is so crucial in the work that you're all doing. And so I, I guess the question is about what role um, imagining and imagining a future, imagining decriminalized futures, for example, or uh, imagining revolution, um, both now and in this fictional future, what role that kind of plays um, in spurring on the organizing work that you do or in creating this um, kind of space or this world to draw on when you're feeling depleted or when you're feeling like, um, you know, there are all of these roadblocks in the way. How do we begin to kind of think about the, um, the imagination, political imagination, or the future um, now and, you know, uh, in time to come, essentially. Um, I think it's, it's like, yeah, like you said, it's, it's one of the, it's something that's really core cool to abolition is to be able to imagine outside of these structures, outside of punishment and to really imagine like a whole, a whole different world. For me, it's actually also been really, really digging into not just imagination as if we're like inventing something new, but it's also remembering like, you know, one of the ways that I've connected with some of my elders around abolition has been when they've said, wait, what did we do before the police then? You know, like that they understand that actually this hasn't been something that's been here all along. So what is it that we did used to do to support each other? And also what have we been doing to support each other? What are these creative ways that we don't consider care, that we don't consider crisis support, but actually is, you know, um, the ways that our communities have housed each other and supported each other and challenged each other um, and these systems all along and really taking our imagination to think about how we expand that, what we could do with that um, to create something new and different and and also healing, you know, like 
I think for me and and starting Cradle Community as a collective is really about transformative justice and really about starting to build something new um, and how we explore that. So tapping into all our existing skills and resources, challenging the ways that we approach things in like a competitive, uh, competitive or an exploitative or um, any of these kinds of ways when we think about not just our relationships but also our relationship to land and space and all these things um, and to really think about how do we create those spaces for joy you know for us to to experience um, something that allows us to imagine that life could be like that, you know? Um, something that was incredible about the Sisters Uncut Holloway occupation was to go into this space and feel like we've created this little world, you know, that, that everyone who enters that space is part of something and, and it's collaborative and, and that we are really trying to do something different. And even on like a small level to enter that space means that you're like maybe other things could be like this. Why is it that I'm able to have these kinds of interactions with people where we're able to deal with conflict in a generative way or these kinds of things or where we can just be ourselves and be comfortable and safe. That's something that so many people don't experience on a daily basis, right? So, so creating those space, spaces to, to allow us to imagine, I think has been really important. Um, and having yeah, but so much of it comes down to resources is the thing, I think, like having time, having space, having energy. And I, th I find it really difficult to think about how we how we build this without also being tied to like funding and and these problematic sort of systems as well. But yeah. Avia, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, I think, I think that like envisioning and imagining um, a different world is a really important part of like my organizing and I think, um, I don't think we do it enough to be honest, I don't think we make enough space um, to imagine what things could be like, because we're constantly fighting fires, mm. but it gives a lot of life when you're able to think, sit and think like what could we mean to each other if we weren't living in this, you know, good, awful, grinding capitalist society, like what could our communities look like when they were really looking after each other? And just like, you know, just little different things come to mind in terms of, you know, um, you know, when the prisons have been dismantled, you know, I think it's important to think about that, that period of society, like when capitalism has been dismantled, how we're going to rebuild society how are we going to rebuild our communities after that after the trauma that we've all fucking experienced all this time you know it's going to be a huge a huge task and like you know i've learned a lot from um web the boys or bois i never really know how to say it boys. <laughs> boys. um like in terms of reconstruction and his ideas around reconstruction post-slavery i feel like we can learn a lot about those ideas um, you know, and it's not just about um, the prisons, but it's also what we've been talking about today around education, around um, transformative justice. So when there is violence in a, in a family home um, because of trauma and because of overcrowding, it's not just about, you know, getting that person who's committed that violence to apologise, but it's about addressing that problem, you know, making sure that people have appropriate and safe um, housing. Um, that's appropriately spaced and that their trauma is addressed and you know I you know envisage a society where education is available to all and we're not siphoning people off into prisons or universities into good and bad but actually having genuine open access so that anyone who wants to learn regardless has access to that who has access we have all these resources but we've we've built up walls to to stop people from accessing them and the same way around health like you know the stuff i was talking about earlier that that that, that information is there in our history you know that we've um you know we have this amazing radical past of being able to address our healthcare needs amongst ourselves by sharing by 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 um you know um putting money in to, to, to make sure that we've got our local healthcare needs um, supported. And the same with, um, in terms of social reproduction, you know, how many, how many women around the world are shit like 
by themselves raising kids, looking after elderly re relatives or the, um, the adults in their lives alone. Why do we do that? Why do we have to do that? You know, it, that alone causes so many problems. We could so easily transform it, this society, so that that, um, that is shared between all of us. So like, you know, when I'm envisaging a world afterwards, I feel like, you know, we're going to have to rebuild so many, um, so many of these different parts of, you know, healthcare, social reproduction, um, education, all of these different areas to rebuild our community so that they're healthy and strong. Thank you so much. Um, Elio, do you want to round us off? Yeah, I would love to round us off. Um, I think the Two, there's two things I want to say. And the first one is sort of answering one of the questions that was in the Q&A um, and also speaking to the a question of an imagined future is that like working on the Swarm Hardship Fund in some ways, like the collective work that we did was that, that imagined future, right? Like started with five of us and expanded to 10 and we shared the work amongst us and it was really hard, you know? Sometimes it was really difficult. You're talking to people and hearing really difficult stuff. Some people would, you know, speaking to people on the phone and they do 10 conversations in a row and you're really holding a lot of emotional weight. Um, and we tried to take care of each other through that. And when we saw people getting burnt out or taking on too much, we'd kind of do these like gentle interventions with each other to share the work around in different ways. Um, you know, we worked to our strengths and people took on work that like spoke to what their interests were or their skills were, but not in a way that was kind of laborious necessarily, but like what people felt called towards. And I think that kind of careful, caretaking, like work that was about like recognizing what people are best at and supporting them to do it and helping them to do it is really that kind of future I want to imagine where we're able to like live lives that look like that and it doesn't mean that we won't sometimes do difficult things or sometimes experience discomfort or sometimes experience hardship but that we will like support and care for each other um, in doing it and then the thing that I would love to end on is there's this collective from San Francisco called Gay Shame and they kind of fight or they do actions kind of fighting gentrification in San Francisco and they have this poster that is on my wall. I'm gonna read it to you because I think it's like such a good thing to end on. And it says, we are committed to a trans queer extravaganza that brings direct action to spectacular levels of confrontation. We work collectively outside boring and deceptive nonprofit models to fight white supremacy, capitalism, ableism, cops, settler colonialism, and all forms of domination. Liberals think we are frivolous de decorations and mainstream gays want us gone. Against them and with each other, we instigate, irritate, and agitate to build cultures of devastating resistance. Thank you. That was such a that's such a beautiful note to end on. And I want to say thank you so much, um, Kelsey, Elio, Avia. This has been such a, a generative and enriching conversation for me. Um, I want to say thank you to the audience as well. And I'm just going to pass back over to Livy, who's going to close us out. Yeah, uh, just to reiterate, Lola, a huge thank you to everyone for joining us and participating in the conversation tonight, um, especially to our panellists um, as activists and organisers. I know there's, it's just a really busy time for you all, so thank you so much for taking the time to share your work and your thoughts with us. Um, so to Lola, Kelsey, Avia, Elio, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you also to the BSL interpreters, uh, Ali and Sharon, thank you. <laughs> If you want to support their work, uh, you can donate to Swarm and their hardship fund still uh, through their website. Also check out uh, London Renters Union and the work that Sister Space is doing in Hackney. Uh, they're a charity dedicated to supporting African and Caribbean heritage women and girls affected by domestic violence and sexual abuse. And they're currently fundraising to keep their vital services open. Um, I'm sure there are loads of shout outs we could do, <laughs> but um, if you enjoyed tonight's free event, I'd also like uh, to invite you to consider donating to Autograph as a charity to support our work and to enable us to continue to host uh, free conversations like the one you've heard tonight. And you can do that through our website, which is autograph.org.uk forward slash donate. Uh, we'd also be grateful if you could just take five minutes to complete the survey that will be emailed to you uh, and give us your feedback on tonight's event. Uh, that is everything from me. So all that's left to say is another huge thank you to everyone and uh, good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>